Welcome to the Entree Pastors Podcast on YouTube. This is a show that helps pastors think, act, and thrive as prosperous entrepreneurs. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Entree Pastors Podcast on YouTube. This is episode number 16. My name is John Sanders. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. And guys, today you are in for a real treat as we interview a guy by the name of Kent Julian. Kent used to be a full-time youth pastor and has had some other positions within uh, you know, traditional church ministry. But a few years back, he transitioned into a career as a full-time professional speaker. So we're titling this episode, Paid to Speak with Kent Julian. And uh, you're going to hear an incredible story of transformation, how he went from working inside the church world to really working in a lot of corporate settings as a highly sought after professional speaker. And this is really something you're going to find that many pastors could do. Uh, if you're a pastor, chances are really good that you're comfortable in a public speaking role. And you might just assume that's easy and anyone can do this. But guys, the reality is most people are terrified of speaking in public. And if you're gifted in that arena, and if you apply yourself in some strategic ways, you can find a very lucrative career around speaking in public, doing something that you and I as pastors do every single week and often give very little thought to it. So you're in for a great interview where Les and I sat down with Kent Julian. And we talked about how you can get paid to speak. Guys, check this interview out. Well, all right, everybody. We got Kent Julian on the podcast today. Man, great to see you, Kent. Thank you so much for being here, bro. Hey, thank you. It's great to be seen. I'm excited about this. We're glad I really to have looking, you. Yeah, I'm, uh, sorry, John. Go ahead, man. Oh, that's it. I was just wanting Kent to know we're glad to have him. Glad he put a shirt on for the interview. So welcome. <laughs> Indeed, that's what, Got dressed exactly up right. a little bit. Well, I tell you what, man, I've really been looking forward to this conversation, Kent, because we've known each other for a while and I know that you understand entree pastors. So I'm just looking forward to the conversation and to get things kicked off for the folks that don't quite know you yet. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why this topic and why this tribe is especially important to you? Well, yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, love. I, first of all, thank you for inviting me in. Second, um, I, I might be the model child for Entree uh, Pastor. So um, I started out, I'm married, by the way. I'm married to my wife, Kathy. We've been married 30 years. We have three kiddos. And I started out as a youth pastor, um, so st started out very, very small church and was a youth pastor in a small church and saw some success in that. And then went at the time, it was one of the larger churches in the U.S. Um, and was the youth pastor there. And then I became the national youth director of a Denam um, from there. And so uh, I'm taking a long, long 20 year journey and I just put it into 30 seconds there. There was a lot of ups and downs throughout that whole thing. While I was doing that, I was doing some stuff on the side, which I know people that are inter that are in here probably do those kind of things. I wrote a couple books, um, was involved in training other youth pastors, was involved in some speaking on the side. And then while I was the national youth director, uh, the executive director of a national youth ministry uh, during that time, really just since um, that I wasn't going to stay in full-time vocational ministry. I'm obviously in full-time ministry. That's my life, but in full-time vocational ministry. And I actually, we can talk about this later, but I actually knew that from the beginning. I really felt called to youth ministry. Uh, never really wanted to be a senior pastor, a big church pastor, you know, the big people's church pastor. Um, I did get confused during the journey a little bit, but early on, the calling was always towards youth ministry. And when youth ministry was over, I, I used to say, I don't know what I'll do, but I'll probably just do something else. And so, again, to make a long story short, while I was uh, the national youth director of a Denam, 
I actually launched a side business and was able to grow it over about three year period to the place where I was able to uh, leave that position, the national youth director's position in a very positive way, by the way, the transition was extremely positive, which was important to me because in my, I'm giving you a lot of snapshots here, but in my, that's good. But in my previous churches, one, I left extremely positive and the other was extremely negative. In fact, I, I kind of joke, I say that uh, at this one church that I left, you know, and, and if you're watching this on video, you can see this, I'm raising my hand high. And I was like, Jesus was like here and Kent Julian was right there. <laughs> and that's like right below him. And then on the other one that I left, Satan was down here and Kent Julian was barely above him. I mm. mean, so I'm just, I, I say that in obviously just trying to be funny, but in reality, one, I left really, really well. And one um, did not leave well. So leaving the national position to, to go into my uh, business, that I started full time and doing that well and passing the baton well was, was, uh, huge to me. And so I felt like I did that. And so for the last, um, it's been since 2008 that I've been full time. So for the last 13 years, I've been full time in my own business. I'm a professional speaker and have done multiple different things for uh, revenue and always with a, a ministry mindset, even though I'm not doing any kind of work in churches or for, um, faith-based organizations. It's all, you know, in the business world and uh, with youth and educators and business leaders. So that that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, you're right. You are in so many ways a poster child for what an entree pastor really is. You're when when John and I first began brainstorming and you know talking about who we would really have speak into the people that are a part of our tribe. You were the one of the first, if not the first, that came to my mind for those very reasons. You, you truly okay. were. So what I'd like to do is for you, if you can, just go back. And uh, you mentioned something that I love. You, you said, I'm paraphrasing, but you basically said that you never left ministry. As far as a local church setting, that's a different world than the one in many ways that you are in now. But would you talk some more about what that, what, what the sense of ministry is that didn't change? I, I would just ask it this way, maybe. What is it about being called to serve people you know, to, uh, to, to be a manifestation of, of God's grace in that way. What didn't change from that local church in being employee of a, of a local church or ministry, what didn't change as far as ministry, but what did change? Uh, well, that's a, that's a great way to say it. So one thing that this is one thing that, um, I think would encourage all the pastors that are listening in. One thing that didn't change was our commitment to, to the local church. And so we have stayed very committed to the local church. We've, uh, we volunteer, we're, we're absolutely involved. So when our kids were younger, we were very involved in the youth ministry and, um, uh, attending church, being, being those people that are, you know, I mean, just imagine having somebody who has 20 years staff experience and the positions I don't want, I don't want to be on the board. I don't want to be in any of those kind of leadership positions. I want to be somebody who's in the trenches supporting uh, the, the pastors never, never going, Hey, we did it this way. Or we, you know, just being a, somebody who's gives counsel that way. So we do the same thing. Now, my wife and I were empty nesters, but my wife and I are very involved. We run the, the cafe at the church on Sunday morning. It's a youth part that we run. And then we host a, a young married Bible study at our house. So one thing that didn't change is our commitment to the local church. We really, really believe that. That, by the way, has been really positive too, because all three of our kids are adult kids. We see in their lives, um, not only are they committed to Christ, they're very committed to the local church. And, and that's, you know, that's not something you see in a lot of young people today, um, even young people who grew up in the church. 
Um, the other thing is I would say is, and, and I'll just end with this and then you can ask more questions, but I like to look at, so, so when you get out into the business world and the real easy answer is to say, well, I look at opportunities to, you know, serve people when I'm out speaking, I look for opportunities to share the gospel with people one-on-one -on -one when I can, all those type of things. But here's where I think it's the most interesting, especially for entree pastors, um, is one of the things we learn in ministry is how, how do you serve people with no strings attached? And that has made its way into the way that I market my services as a speaker, you're marketing your services a lot. And so the way that I market my speaking services in particular is I market and serve with no strings attached, whether I ever get hired by an organization or not. And that actually ends up giving me a huge marketing advantage compared to so many of the other speakers that I'm working with because their number one desire is get booked, get booked, get booked. You know, they're pushing and pushing and pushing. And my approach is way more, let me give you something of value. Whether you ever hire me or not, that's going to be taken care of. It sounds like I have great faith and, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, there's times in the business where I'm like, holy cow, how are we going to make this? But it never gets to the point where I get pushy and salesy versus no, I'm going to serve. And if I serve, I know God's going to take care of the other stuff. I, do I want to close business? Do I ask for business? Yes, I do all those things, but I've got a huge marketing advantage. And I learned it in ministry by learning how to serve with no strings attached. You know what? I'm going to put a bookmark right there for one second, Kent, because at the end of uh, our initial time together for those that want to do a deeper dive we're going to spend some backstage time and i, I know some of your story and I, I know that the mindset issues that you had early on especially as you and your wife were were really dealing with what that call looked like and all that gets down into the weeds a little bit but it's an important story and i want to get there in just a little while but i'm gonna go uh, kick this uh, over for a few minutes to john because i know he's got a couple of questions too well, yeah, one of those questions was absolutely related to mindset as you transitioned out of your pastoral role in quote ministry role into this new, you know, entrepreneurial thing as a professional speaker. But so we can get into that in a minute, maybe. But then the next one's more of a business focused. I'm just going to go right to the money. Did you have any hangups mentally around, you know, seeing what I do as ministry? And now I'm in a position where I can charge for it and charge maybe quite a bit more than what I did and was expected, you know, to receive in the church world. Um, so I, I want to ask about your mindset around money issues and then maybe another money related question, more business. So I think in ministry, one of the things I see is we work with a lot of pastors is in some ways there's these golden handcuffs that keep them trapped in their pastoral role. Now the gold doesn't run very deep, right? It's really flaky gold, but it's but bronze. It's that, yeah. It's that fear of losing my only paycheck. If I jump into this new entrepreneurial thing, you know, maybe they don't just want to go get a job at Walmart, you know, for eight bucks an hour, but they, they want to do something, build a business. So there's kind of that gap of starting out on my own and building that up. So I'd just love to hear some of your experience from the financial standpoint of transitioning from ministry into business? Though, man, there, those are such great questions. And I love, I love the opportunity to talk about, uh, about these things. Cause I think it's really important. Um, first of all, I will tell you this, what's really interesting is, um, I, the different churches and then the denomination that I served, it was really interesting. The, the first church I served, the board definitely had the idea of, you know, cheap labor, get them for as cheap as we can. The second church that I served, um, it was in Omaha, Nebraska. And at the time, I don't know if they're still like this, but at the time they wanted, one of the things when they hired me is they said, you know, we really don't want your wife to work and we pay in a way that she shouldn't have to work. And I, so I thought that was great. I was a young 26 year old guy. 
but th- so I, that was great. And we went there, but then what happened was as I um, did well and led well, um, they not only rewarded you with, you know, congratulations and all that kind of stuff. They actually ended up financially rewarding me. Um, and they, took, yeah, they took real, they paid their staff. If you did a good job, they paid your, the staff well, and it wasn't, you know, you got to kiss up to other people. It wasn't anything like that. It was really a kind of a performance-based thing. Um, and one board member told me after about three years there, you know, he said, we love what you're doing. We love how you're doing it. We love your heart, your attitude, how you're leading with character. And he said, we want to make sure that finances are never a reason you leave this church. I mean, where have you ever heard that before? Mm, you know, ever. Yeah. So, uh, so the great thing is you had, you know, we had really strong leaders there. We had an extremely involved, but very godly, wise board. So they were very hands-on, um, but they were strong leaders. I started learning a lot about business, even though I didn't know I was learning about business. Mm. Wow. And then long story short, I went to a, another church in Chicago for nine months. That was the really bad experience where I, I, didn't, I didn't do well there. I didn't leave well. And then I went to the national office and was at this national office for seven years. And what really bugged me there is I would see people who weren't performing well but I knew like there I got back into the system of, you know, this is what you get paid. This is what this position pays you. If you're lucky, you get a $30 uh, Walmart card as a Christmas bonus, you know, oh. and you might get a 2% raise and, oh, if funds doesn't come up, we're going to have to cut your pay by 10%. Oh. And I would see people working there. And they weren't performing well, and yet they had job security. And that really started to bug me. And I don't know, I just think it's in my DNA. And I'm sure being in a system for seven or eight years where a church said, hey, if you do a good job, it's not like I, was, I wasn't making what I'm making now, but they took care of me and they, they rewarded that. So, so all that to get back to your thing, two things. One is, um, you know, I really think that uh, I've always been a good steward of our, my wife and I have been good stewards of what God gives us. And so we, um, we've always lived below our means, you know, from day one when we first got married and she didn't have a job and I'm making $12,000 and having to be bi- bivocational, you know, $12,000 a year, that's, we, we would make it work. And so when God's rewarded us, it's not like, I mean, we, we just, I don't have any problem with making more money because I just feel like it gives us more opportunities to, uh, to steward it well. So I would say that with the money, I will tell you the other question you asked was, you know, the golden handcuffs, that is a hard thing. So when I, when I was starting my business, What's what's really interesting now, looking back, I go, one of the benefits of being a pastor when I started my business, the bad thing about being a pastor is I didn't make a lot of money. The good thing about being a pastor and starting business is I didn't make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It was way easier to get to the point where I quit my full-time job because I didn't have to replace a huge income when I've worked with people who are, you know, six figures uh, and and higher. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, in fact, I just had a phone call today with a guy who does feel like he has golden hand cuffs. He's, he's, he's stuck and he owns this business and he wants to get into speaking and he, he can't get out because he's saying the good thing about his job or his business is he makes a lot of money. The bad thing about trying to do something else is he makes a lot of money. So that is a thing. But if anybody's looking at it in the pastoral setting, um, you know, I, I know they're golden handcuffs, but 
if you pick up some side hustle and you start working it and you stick with it and you start making a little bit of money, um, the, the journey for me, the way it went, it was a three-year process. And so we're talking back in 2005 when I started this. My first year, all the side hustle working 15 to 20 hours a week on my side hustle, my total revenue my first year was four grand. That's not profit, that's revenue. Wow. Four grand. My next year, it was 24 grand. Now, here's what's interesting. The 6,000 of that grand, that 6,000 of that money uh, came in the first six months. So if you do the numbers, it was $10,000 the first 18 months of business, total revenue. Wow. But the next six months was 18. So I pretty much doubled my income, my revenue, I should say, in a third of the time. And then my third year, we did $64,000 worth of revenue. And that's when I got to the place where I said, hey, when I look at the money, I'm getting to the place where I, I haven't replaced my income as far because that was revenue. I haven't replaced my income, but I'm only doing this 20 hours a week, you know, 15 hours a week on the side. Um, if I can give it full-time attention, I bet you I could double that revenue and then I will have replaced my, my income. Um, and so that's exactly how it happened. But the, 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 the thing is, when you think about those golden handcuffs, those first 18 months, it was like, I don't know if I can ever replace this income. The, the next six months, when I doubled our revenue in a third of the time, that's when I started going, I think this could work. Mm-hmm. And so stick to is when it comes to trying to start something on the, your, on the side, stick to becomes a great competitive advantage because most people give up nope. after 12 months. They just like, I, I don't, they just don't stay focused. And nope. if you just say, I, I kept saying to myself, um, no matter how hard it is or how long it takes, I'm going to be able to do this. The other thing I know I'm sharing all kinds of stuff, but it's it's Good. so much fun. This this is the last thing I'll say about this. The other thing is in my position as the national youth director, we did a major conference every three years where we would go in like the last one, one of the last ones I did was in um, Phoenix and we would go down and we would for a week rent out the Phoenix basketball arena and all the hotels around there. And we would do a five-day conference where we'd have seven to 8,000 people come in. And it was a major, major multi-million dollar thing to put on. And I knew that if I was within 18 months of that event, it would be, it would not serve my denomination well to quit because I'd put a new guy in an impossible position to do that event. And so that event was July, 2007. And I said, and when I started my business in 2005, I said, I've got to quit sometime in the first six months of 2008, Mm. or, or I'm going to have to stay on another three years. And so that was a huge motivating factor to say, I don't want to do this another three years. And I don't think it would be good for the denomination. I'd already been doing it. You know, by the time I finished, I had done it for seven years. And I said, I don't think me doing it when my heart's not in it, you know, that next run is good for the denomination either. So there, wow. those were just motivating factors to me. Well, I appreciate your integrity there too, Kent. That's, that's, that's huge. And you, there were several gold nuggets in there. So I want to, I want to ask you to talk more and more about one of those, especially one of those. And I'm and sorry is, if I'm being wordy. It's just, I oh haven't man, talked about look, this listen, stuff in a long time. It's good stuff. The people, the people that are in our tribe are going to eat this up oh, and, and I am, I'm eating it up too. And yeah. I know the one, one of the things is especially true that you just mentioned that I think speaks to one of the major, major concerns of uh, someone in ministry who's even trying to figure this out or thinking about making this sort of shift, even if it's, even if they have a longer off ramp, the big question people want to ask is, man, if this is, is this going to work? And the thing that I heard you say in a little different way a minute ago is it was going to work. I mean, something was going to work because you were not going to stop. Now I also know that you've, you've needed to pivot 
a few times over the course of that. So it's not as if you made your mind up to what it exactly needed to look like, but you did make up your mind that it was going to be different. It was going to be something else. It was going to be the way that God wired you. And then you just weren't going to quit. And my guess would be Kent, that if that deadline would have come and you, you wouldn't have accomplished the goals that you wanted to accomplish. I mean, I don't know what you would have done, but I think you would have probably maybe hit pause for a little while and then come at it again. It sounds to me as if you had your mind made up that something was going to change and something was going to shift, even though you didn't know quite what it was. Yeah. And, and by that t- time, if it hadn't happened all the way, but it happened enough to where, all right, e- even if I quit now, I can't replace my income. If I, if I was at, um, if I wasn't like at zero, if I had had some sort of success like I had had in those three years, I I would have waited tables. I would, I coached swimming for years and years and years. I would have um, enhanced that. Like there were options to where I could have moved out of that full-time position. And again, part of it was I wanted to leave well. I wanted to leave and have done a great job pass the baton on. And I knew if I was going to stay there another three years, they were going to be getting my leftovers. And I did not want to do that to the organization. So, and you're, Les, you are so right. It, what I'm doing now, I mean, it, it does look like what I thought I would probably do way back then, but it's in so many ways, there's so many things I couldn't even imagine Mm -hmm. yesterday, Les and John, we, uh, for a mastermind that I lead, I brought in Mary Ann Rayner, who's gone through all my speaker training and she came in. So I've had a front row seat. In fact, her first event was an event with Dan Miller, where she was going through coaching with excellence. And she, she was really insecure. I mean, she tells me all this stuff. I didn't know that she didn't know who I was. Um, And they all introduced themselves that one night the night before. And then the next day, and I was just so impressed with her that the next day before anything started, I just walked up to her and I said, Hey, I just want you to know, man, you, you have really great energy. What you were presenting last night, you just had really great energy. And I just wanted to tell you that. I mean, that's basically what I said to her. (laughs) And she was like, well, who's that strange bald guy. And the next (laughs) thing she knows I'm being introduced as the speaking expert there. And she's like, holy cow. So anyway, that's how we started. She went through some training with me. She had a vision of what her business and her speaking was going to look like. So this is five years. This is a five-year experience. So we bring her in to my mastermind um, yesterday and she's explaining what her business looks like now. And it's the exact same thing. If she, she said, this is what I thought it was going to look like this is what it looks like now. And I couldn't even envision doing this and this and this five years ago, let alone two years ago. So for all your guys and gals that are thinking about, um, you know, branching out, you will pivot. You, I I like to say it this way, you know, number one, I, I lead my business and my life by two things. I have a compass which is like my purpose. And I've got all different kinds of things. It's a written document I call my compass, but it points to my true North. It points to my relationship with God, what I value, things like that. So I'm all, I look at my compass every week to remind myself, this is the true North in my life. But then I have a map and my map doesn't look like, uh, Hey Siri, you know, take me from point A to point B. It doesn't look like a roadmap. It looks like a treasure map and the treasure map if you can just picture like a a map and up here in the corner is the X marks the spot. That's what I'm trying to get to. But to be honest with you, I don't even know what's, I kind of know what's in there. And so when I first started, it was like, um, have a six figure business, have freedom financially and, and vocationally, um, be speaking, you know, and it's kind of like that. But then the, the way that I get there is I put certain landmarks on the map because I know I'm just going to try to get to that landmark. So it might be a speaking engagement in a professional setting. That was like a landmark on my map. So everything gets focused on trying to get there. And when I get there, number one, I'm not even sure how I'm going to get there. It's going to jiggle. It's like a treasure map where you're just kind of following the, the breadcrumbs to get there. 
But then when I get there at that landmark, and let's say it repre it's represented by mountains, I'm going to be able to see all kinds of new things that I couldn't see if I had never gotten to that landmark. Mm -hmm. And I might see new landmarks that's going to get me closer to this X marks the spot on my map that I'm thinking of, you know, I might help me get there even better. So that's kind of how I envision it. And the, this whole entrepreneur thing, you pivot like crazy and people get scared of that. But I go, don't be scared of it because you, if you, if you get to a certain landmark, the pivot's going to make more sense than what you thought, you know, a year ago when you were trying to do this from scratch and you had no perception of reality. Like from there, you've got, oh, I can see these new things. That pivot totally makes sense. So I hope that, I hope that helps. Yeah, that, I... that's awesome. It, that's, that's so good. And as a matter of fact, we have, we have so many people that would love to hear more about what that speaking, you know, business looks like, because so many people have spent that time on the stage of some, whether they've been in student ministry or as a senior pastor or teaching pastor, a lot of them think that 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 everybody can do what they do when you and I know that that is not the case and so but not everybody in our audience is that concern is that uh, interested in what that speaking business would look like so in just a minute we'll we'll dig down a little deeper for anybody that wants to go that way in the backstage as well so I would just say this and John I'm going to kick it back to you one more time and and we can uh, kind of wrap up the interview um do tell us though how we got people. I know that you coach a lot of people, not just people interested in having a speaking business or ministry, but others as well. So if somebody listens to this, they resonate with what you've said and they say, Man, I need to have another conversation with this guy. How can somebody make that happen? Or how can they see some resources that you have can help them on this that can help them on this journey? And I'll just put in a shameless plug uh, for what John and I are doing as well. You know, we in our, inside of our membership, this is the kind of content that people really want the most. Mm. And so we, we help people go from point A to point B. And one of those tracks is building a similar, a, a personal platform with, you know, their, their content. And so those are the people that would be really interested most in that. So I, this is what I would say. And I, I, you know, I would, I would lead people to what you are doing because that's it. What I would say is if there are people that are interested in speaking, the I'll, I'll share a free resource and then something you can listen to. So the free resource, if they go to paid to speak podcast.com slash nine ways. So the, the number nine and ways. So paid to speak podcast.com slash nine ways that will get them. What I did is, um, a lot of times people don't realize this, but there's so many ways to get paid as a speaker. And I'm talking about where somebody's giving you a check. So there's ways to get paid as a speaker where I go speak somewhere for free. And I invite people to go into a mastermind with me and I might get 10 people at, you know, however much money. And that, that is like a $50,000 speaking engagement. I'm not even talking about that. That's one way, but these are Hey, an organization is going to give me a check to come in and speak. Most people think it's, you know, you're on the main stage. There's multiple ways to do it. So that sh shares all these different nine ways you can get paid as a speaker. Okay. So it's paid speak podcast.com slash nine ways. And then the resource, the, the thing they can listen to, if they just want to listen to the paid to speak podcast, they can find it at the same place, paid to speak podcast.com. I've done 52 episodes. I put them out every other week. As far as like other stuff, I've got a mastermind group with business leaders, but though almost all the other things that I do, I, I really get to know the people before we invite them into that. Right. And so, because it's just the dynamic and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So um, where, where, I'm doing most of my stuff is out there being a professional speaker and then helping other people uh, who want to become speakers learn how to do that. Well, I love this, Kent, and I'm, I'm very grateful just that you shared so transparently some of the numbers, especially from early on. That, that fires me up. I love the you know, six-figure success stories, but I also like hearing the very practical because it shows me, man, if Kent Julian can struggle through a you know, $4,000 revenue first year, I can, you know, that makes my year first year look 
better than his and I can yeah there you go about it so that's <laughs> awesome I also know right now there's a bunch of pastors Googling churches in Omaha, Nebraska, looking for the HR <laughs> email of that church. There. So in the backstage, we'll just have you save them time and tell them where they can call. <laughs> okay. No, okay. man, this has been so good, Kent. I appreciate Here, it. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Can I share one more thing? Absolutely. And you made me think of this. If there's one thing, and I am always super honest about this, if there's one thing that gets under my skin, it's people who are saying, oh, you can do this in a year. I, um, it, I have not met anybody. The only time I've ever met somebody who's gone from full-time work to their own full-time business in less than really three years, the only time I've ever seen that is when there's some sort of backstory. They either had some connection, they already had a big platform or a big following they wrote some book or whatever and what what really bugs me is some of the people who are promoting that if they would honestly and i sometimes i don't even think it's that they're they're not sitting there trying to lie to you they've just forgotten mm -hmm. their story and mm -hmm. how long yeah. it actually took them and when you take them back and you go well yeah maybe you went you know you were able to expand your income really fast in a year, but how long did it get you to that point? They go, Oh yeah, I was doing this, this, and this. And I go, Oh, so that was five years. And they're like, Oh yeah, I guess so. And I, I just think we do a big disservice to people because they, they throw in the towel versus saying to them, listen, this journey ahead of you, it's a blast. It's fun. Even if, even if it takes you tons longer or you don't make it, it's still going to be worth it. You will learn things you will never learn unless you go on this journey. You're going to meet people you'll never meet if you don't go on this journey and opportunities will open up. So for instance, I was so connected with group publishing at the time. Um, I was so connected with them. And as, a, and as a youth pastor, I was doing training for them. But once I started my own business on the side, they actually said to me kind of off the record or whatever, they're like, we're looking at doing this. Would you be interested in that position? So I had job opportunities come up to me because of what I was doing. So you meet people, you learn things, opportunities come up. So even if it takes a while, which it does, it's still a win. That's how you have to look at it. Good things happen when you move in that direction. That is so good. Well, Kent, we're going to invite you to stick around and join us backstage here in just a few minutes. This has been super helpful. We're grateful for your time and uh, wish you all the best as you continue to serve people in your role as an entree pastor. So stick tight. We'll join you backstage here shortly. Thank you, guys. Well, hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Entree Pastors podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can be notified every time we release a new episode. If you'd like to get connected to other pastors who are learning to think, act, and thrive as prosperous entrepreneurs, then we invite you to check us out on Facebook. Just search for the Entree Pastors Connect group, answer a few of our simple questions there, and we'd love to include you in the conversations. And if you're really ready to go to the next level, then we invite you to join our Entree Pastors membership community. When you become a monthly subscriber, you will receive access to courses, exclusive community, and coaching that will help you along in your own Entree Pastors journey. If there's anything else we can do to serve you, please visit us at EntrePastors.com and we will do our best to serve you there. God bless everybody. See you soon.